morning. Welcome to Reformed Presbyterian Church here in Ephrata, Pennsylvania. This is our worship service for Sunday, April 26th, 2020. It was a great delight last week to see so many of our RPC Church family on a Zoom fellowship hour, and I'm hopeful that we'll have even more this week, so please join us after the service for that. If you're visiting with us, we're glad that you tuned in. We're glad that you found us somewhere on the internet. And we pray that this service would be a blessing to you. We also pray that maybe someday, hopefully in the not too distant future, we'll see you right here, worshiping in person among us. You know, in scripture, God's people are described as both gathering and scattering. And the church is both a place where God's people gather together to, to, to join together to worship, but also to be dispersed among the nations or among their community to be salt and light wherever that they go. Now, of course, in this season of life that we're in, uh, it feels like all we are are scattered and dispersed. We haven't been able to, to gather, at least in the way that we're so accustomed to. But technology being what it is in 2020, we still intend to, to gather as best we can and to worship as best we're able, given our circumstances. But our worship is not limited to what we can do uh, physically or technologically. Our worship comes from the heart. A heart that is full of, of gratitude and thankfulness, full of the grace that the Lord has shown us. And so I ask that you would join me this morning in our call to worship as we gather together, though separate, to worship God together. Our call to worship, which will come up on your screen, is what we typically do on a Sunday morning as we have a uh, responsive reading as we work through the scripture. So please join me now for the call to worship. Our call to worship from Isaiah chapter 40. Go up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up. Fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those that are with young. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, our God, as we gather this morning in our homes across the county, Lord, we pray that you would be with us. We pray, Lord, that you would be pleased with our worship. May our hearts be united together even though we are apart. May they be united with one another, with all the believers and saints around the world and all the believers and saints throughout history, that we might with one voice sing your praise. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll open our service this morning with our hymn, number 53, Praise to the Lord the Almighty. Please join us in song from wherever you are this morning.
For our confession of faith this morning, we will again be reciting the Apostles' Creed together. We've decided to do this for several weeks in a row on purpose, uh, primarily because it is a way in which our children can stay involved in the worship service. Uh, many of our children have learned this creed in children's worship, and so it's a way for them to feel as if they can participate in worship. They are part of our church family, and so we love to have them join us, and even at, at time to lead us. So we'll be confessing the Apostles' Creed again, and for those of us adults, it'd be good for us to work on memorizing it as well as our children do. So let's confess together. Children and Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This time our worship team will be leading us in song. Again, like last week, it's so great to see so many of their faces uh, as, they, as they sing and play music to the Lord. Let's join them in song this morning from our living rooms, from our dining rooms, knowing that to the Lord he hears all of us together.
Well, many thanks once again to our worship team for putting in the time and the effort and just the creative talents to, uh, to be able to produce uh, music for us that we can worship uh, as best we're able during this time. We're really such a delight to, to see them and to um, feel have some semblance of normal once again. So thank you to them. At this time, it's our privilege to go before the Lord in prayer. So would you please join me as we pray together? Oh, Lord, our God, it is beautiful to sing to you. It is beautiful to sing the words in Christ alone, reminding us where our hope is found, where all good things are found, where grace is found. And, Lord, it is good to see all of the faces of, of our friends and church family up on the screen. But, Lord, it's also just a poignant reminder that we are separated. But that's the way we have to do things these days. It's a difficulty for us, and we feel the loss. But Lord, we've never really been good, if we're honest. We've never really been good at dealing with adversity. So we pray, Lord, that even during this time, that we would learn from it, that we would grow from it, that you would teach us. You would make us more aware of brothers and sisters around the globe, even in our own neighborhoods, who have been separated from their church families for some time, for all sorts of reasons, whether it's medical reasons, transportation reasons, or they live in places where it's dangerous, where they have to be underground. Lord, may we, the church here in this privileged place, find some solidarity find some common ground with our brothers and sisters who suffer on a much more regular basis. Father, we pray for them. We pray for their strength and their endurance. We marvel at their faith, which has endured for so long. And Lord, we pray for our area, for the churches here in Lancaster County and in Ephrata. We pray that you would sustain them Pray that you would clarify their focus. That they would indeed be centered on Christ alone. Use this refining fire to make us single-minded in purpose and mission and focus. And Lord, we pray for those just in our church family, those who are undergoing a great deal of difficulty the financial strains, the loneliness, depression, as well as all those things that were in existence long before COVID-19 was on our radar. Lord, we think of those who have lost loved ones recently. We pray for their peace. We pray that your presence would be manifest in their life. They would find rest in you, comfort in you. It's in Christ alone. You alone are our rock, our fortress, and our shield, and our great reward. Help your church, Lord. Refine us, though it is difficult. And now, Lord, we turn our attention to our time before us as we open up your word in the book of Acts, as we proclaim it as truth. May we glean from it all that your spirit would have us glean. May it change us, that we might become made into the image of your Son more and more. Conform us to your word and to your will. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we'll be continuing our series in the book of Acts this morning. We'll be looking at the very end of chapter 21 and and most of chapter 22 this morning. We left off last week, Paul has made his way to Jerusalem, where he's got himself in quite a bit of trouble, as he is wont to do. Uh, And this week, we'll be looking at his uh, speech to the Jewish audience, as well as his interaction uh, with the Romans who have him in custody. Now, as I read the passage this morning, which you can find either at the end of your bulletin or, of course, uh, in your own Bible, um, as I read the passage to us this morning, I'll be making a few comments 
uh, as we go along, uh, mostly comments of a uh, more of a historical note, trying to explain just kind of what's going on before we go back and look at the passage as a whole. But before we do that, let's please pray and ask God's blessing. Oh Lord our God, as we open up your word now, uh, may your words be on my tongue, and may your words be resonating in each of our hearts and minds. May your word go forth in us and through us to change us and to change those around us so that more people would call upon the name of the Lord and even your people would do so with greater conviction and clarity and focus and love. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So we'll be reading from the book of Acts, chapter 21, starting in verse 37, reading through chapter 22, verse 29. Twenty-one thirty-seven. As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, May I say something to you? And he said, Do you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptian then, who recently stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness? And let's stop right there and explain this for just a minute. I don't want to spend much time on it in the sermon, so let's make a little note right now. Uh, what the tribune is referring to, and uh, the ancient historian Josephus speaks to this, that there was an Egyptian who came to Jerusalem and stirred up a revolt. He got a bunch of Jewish people together and, and to fight against the Romans. And the Romans came out and fought against them, killed many of the Jews, who were then scattered. The Egyptian, however, escaped. And many people wonder if the Egyptian really was only using the Jewish people as pawns to start a revolt against the Romans. And so the Jews hated this Egyptian. The Romans hated this Egyptian. And now Paul walks into town, and everyone hates him, and he speaks Greek. And so the Tribune says, perhaps this is the Egyptian. That's the historical background for that verse. Verse 39, Paul responds and says, I am a Jew from Tarsus and Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. And again, a little bit of a historical note here. Uh, people were judged by their homeland in the ancient world. Where you were from and that particular place's uh, reputation greatly affected the honor that you were given, the dignity that you had. You think of Nathaniel in John 1 as he's responding to his brother Philip and he says, Can anything good come from Nazareth? Because Nazareth had a certain reputation. Nothing good can come from there. Whereas Tarsus is a city with a good reputation. So by Paul saying that he's from Tarsus, he's sort of proven himself worthy, and so he asks for an audience. Verse 40. And when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language, saying, just another quick little note here. That when it says Hebrew language there, it's, it's a Hebrew dialect. And most historians and scholars think that he was probably speaking in Aramaic, which the Jews would appreciate. It makes him sound like one of their own. It's sort of an insider dialect, an insider accent. Okay, so this is Paul's speech. Chapter 22. Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus and Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus, about noon a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. 
Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and saw him. And he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. When I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another, I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And that's the end of Paul's speech at this point. I'm going to continue reading to see what happens next. But again, I'll have a couple of little comments as we go along. Verse 22 of chapter 22. Up to this word they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks, saying that he should be examined by flogging to find out why they were shouting against him like this. But when they had stretched him out for the whips, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, Is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? So just a note here on what he's talking about. Flogging, or another way to translate this, is a scourging. And we know what this is from historians. There were men called lictors who worked for the Romans. And they were trained to inflict maximum pain. What they would do, the flogs were a series of, of leather uh, strips, leather thongs, that inside of them had bone and metal uh, and sharp rocks. And what the lictor would do as he whipped the victim is that the bone and metal and sharp rocks would embed in the skin and then they would rip it off in such a way that the skin would just peel off. Sometimes a scourging or a flogging resulted in death. However, it was illegal to scourge or flog a Roman citizen. So that's why Paul asks the question that he does. Verse 26, when the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, What are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. So the tribune came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, Yes. The tribune answered, I bought this citizenship for a large sum. Paul said, but I am a citizen by birth. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately, and the tribune also was afraid. For he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. See, Roman citizenship could be purchased for a sum of money, as with the tribune, but it could also be a native right. And when Paul says, I was born a Roman citizen, that means that he outranks the tribune by virtue of being Roman born. And so the tribune is naturally very afraid because what he did uh, is very illegal and very frowned upon to bind and, and to flog or almost flog a Roman citizen. So that should give us some kind of historical backdrop and answer some of those kind of nagging questions that, that come up in the book of Acts as, as we we're, as we're work through it. Uh, we're looking at a very different time and culture and place. So hopefully that answers some of those questions and gives us some, um, some background, some context. But the main part of the passage today, the main part of chapter 22, is Paul's speech to the Jewish audience in Jerusalem. And so let's spend some time looking at that. Now there's a number of speeches that happen throughout the book of Acts by Paul and by Peter and Stephen and others. 
And none of them are prescriptive. None of them are, this is the way you have to do it when you talk to somebody. But they're all examples for us in some way. And so it would be good for us to look at some of the, the characteristics or the strategies or approaches that, that Paul uses as he speaks to the Jews, as he defends himself to the Jews. He says, brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. The Greek word is an, an apologia. We get our word ap apologetics from it. This is his defense of why he is doing what he's doing. You'll notice, first of all, that Paul was polite. Paul minded his manners. He was polite to the Roman tribune. When he says, may I say something to you? When he says that in Greek, it's very formal and polite. And so that goes a long way for the tribune to uh, acquiesce to his, um, to his uh, request. Paul's also very respectful to the Jews. He addresses them as brothers and fathers. A very respectful term, acknowledging uh, both those that are his peers as well as those are, that are simply older than him. So he's polite and respectful. Also, he identifies with the Jews. He goes a long way to, to, make it, to, to convince them that he's one of them. Okay, so first of all, he speaks Aramaic, or whatever the Hebrew dialect, Hebrew language is. But when they hear that he's speaking in that way, uh, they became even more quiet in verse 2. There was already a hush, then they became even more quiet. He's gained their ear because he bothered to speak their language, their dialect. Perhaps he even threw on a kind of a Jerusalem accent. So he spoke their language. He also identified with them in verse 3 by, by mentioning that he was brought up in that city. Yes, I was born in Cilicia, born in Tarsus, uh, but I was brought up in this city. I was brought up right here. I was, I was one of you. I walked these streets. I know my way around. That goes a long way. You know that. Uh, when someone's from a place that you're from, when someone's from here, you give them a, a different respect. He also says, at the end of verse 3, I was zealous for God as all of you are to this day. He says, look, I'm, I'm just like one of you. You're zealous. I'm zealous. I get it. I'm from here too. I'm speaking Aramaic. He's trying to identify with them. He's also establishing his credibility. Here's why you can trust what I'm saying. Not only am I one of you, but I also have credibility outside of that. Still in verse 3, he says, look, I was educated at the feet of Gamaliel. And Gamaliel was a highly respected teacher, rabbi. Highly respected. He basically says, look, I'm one of his prodigy. I'm one of his students. That will gain their respect. He also says, according to the strict manner of, our law, of the law of our fathers. So again, Paul is a, a Jew of Jews. And when it comes to following the law... He's perfect. He's a Gamaliel student. He also says that he has the backing of the council. In verse 5, he says, As the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. It's like, look, you can, you can go to them and ask them. They have my back 100%. They're the ones that gave me letters to send me on my way to Damascus. They know who I am. I was one of them as well as one of you. As he carries on in his story, he also mentions some other things. In verse 12, he mentions Ananias. Ananias is a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there. So it's not only his credibility, but it's Ananias' credibility. So for Ananias' role in this story, you should know that he was a devout man well spoken of by everybody. So you can trust Ananias as well. And then lastly, in verse 17, he says, when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, in other words, I'm still doing what any good Jew would do. When I, as soon as I come into Jerusalem, I go to the temple and I pray. So he is establishing his credibility 
that from his birth he's been a student of Gamaliel, that he had zeal, that he had lawfulness, it's just like Ananias, and it's proven even when he comes back after all of his conversion story, I still come back to Jerusalem and I pray in the temple. So what Paul does in, in this passage is that he simply tells a story. He just tells a story. This is not a very theological speech. We've seen some other ones in Acts that are. This is not a very historical speech when he goes through and traces the whole Jewish history as we've seen in other speeches in the book of Acts. He simply tells his story. Now, every personal testimony has three parts, and Paul has them here. It's what he was, it's what Christ did, and it's who he is now. Every personal testimony works the same way. Here's here's what I was like. Here's what happened when Jesus met me. And here's what happened as a result. And Paul just tells a story. But also his strategy here, or, his, or his, uh, his approach, is that it's focused on Christ. All the turning points in the story happened because of something Jesus did. He was on his way to Damascus when, boom, Jesus appears, or Jesus uh, strikes him blind and then speaks to him. Jesus shows up. And that's the turning point of the story. And even when he gets to Jerusalem, it's Jesus who meets him in a trance and speaks to him and kind of commissions him on his way. Jesus is the one that sent me. I didn't come up with this. He met me on the way to Damascus. Ananias, who's a good man, we all know that, uh, told me these things. I was praying in the temple. And then Jesus shows up. And so off I went. And I can't make any apology for that. That's just what happened. That's just what happened. Now again, we want to be a little bit careful, uh, really in all of the book of Acts, but especially in, in all of these speeches and presentations, that we don't make them prescriptive, as in, this is what you have to do. You have to model it the way Paul did it or Stephen did it, or Peter did it. That's the way you have to present the gospel. That's the way you have to talk to people um, who are in the church, you know, who, are, who are fellow Jews or Christians. That's the way you have to talk to the Romans or the Gentiles. Or the, you know, we can become very prescriptive and legalistic about it. That's not the purpose. However, I do think that there are some principles that Paul goes through um, that, are, that are not exclusive to this story, and there are more that, than that are in this story. But there are some principles here that I think we can take away. So, for one, again, Paul was polite. Paul was respectful. Christian, be polite. I know that sounds just really simple. Just be polite. Be respectful. In 1 Peter 3.15, this is the classic uh, verse for apologetics, right? In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Classic verse for why we do apologetics. But the end of that verse is, yet, do it with gentleness and respect. Gentleness and respect. Be polite, be respectful. Don't just come out swinging. So I remember a friend of mine in college who was a black belt in, uh, I forget which martial art it was. And they said, you know what, the the most dangerous belt is the yellow belt. Because they're the ones that have learned how to hurt you. They haven't learned how to control it yet. And he said, a lot of us, when we're relatively young in the faith, we become yellow belt Christians. And we've learned some, maybe some apologetic arguments, or we've learned some reasons for our faith. We've learned some arguments why... Our particular kind of faith, Presbyterianism, Reformed, is better. And so we're just going to go hammer everybody with it. Don't be a yellow belt Christian. Read the end of this verse. Do so with gentleness and respect. At the end of the conversation, 
does the person you're talking to think, you know, I may not agree with this guy, but at least he's kind. At least he listened to what I had to say. Be polite. Just mind your manners, would you? There's a time sometimes to be harsh, but usually not. Usually we'll do much better with gentleness and respect. The second principle I think we can take away in terms of our own, um, you know, whether you want to think of this as evangelistic strategy or just simply how we talk to neighbors and friends and family and coworkers who are not believers. The second principle is don't underestimate your personal testimony. I think sometimes we either think that the personal testimony isn't really good enough or that our personal testimony just happens to be boring and we underestimate it. But and I think I've said this before to you, but the, you know, your personal testimony is probably the one thing that an unbeliever uh, can't dispute. You can give an apologetic argument and they can give one right back. But when it comes to your personal testimony, look, this is who I was. This is what I felt. This is what happened. They really can't dispute it. They have to deal with it. Paul's having a, a kind of a family discussion. Okay? He's, he's a Jew talking to Jews. It's sort of an in-house discussion. And he simply tells them what he was like. And, and describes his conversion and makes no apology for what he's become. When you're talking to somebody that has known you a long time, you can tell them, like, you know what I was like. I was like this and like that and the other. I met Jesus, and now I'm different. And hopefully you really are different, and they can see that. But even people that, you, that haven't known you for a while, you can still run through that simple testimony. Here's what I was like. I was an awful, wretched person with all sorts of gross sin, or I was a, you know, I was a sort of a do-gooder, went to church my whole life, but it was just sort of superficial. Either way, Jesus met you, saved you from your sin, forgave your sin, and has changed you. Changed not only your behavior, but your affections, what you desire, what you love, what motivates you. Another thing that you'll notice is, is sort of part of that is that Paul offers no judgment only statement. Now again, there's a time to confront people. There's a time to confront people and challenge them. But not always. Again, I would say more often than not, your better tactic is just to simply present the good news of the gospel. Let the Holy Spirit do his job and convict them of their sin. You don't need to be the Holy Spirit. You're just called to be the herald of good news. But lastly, and maybe the biggest takeaway from this passage, is you'll notice that Paul built bridges. Paul was a bridge builder. John Stott wrote a book called Between Two Worlds. And, and in that book, he talks about all the different ways that the Bible describes uh, a preacher. Uh, and he offers an additional way, which is that, that it's a... The preacher is a bridge builder, connecting someone from the world of Scripture uh, to their own life. And the basic premise of that book, though it's written to preachers, it really can apply to, to any of us. Uh, the basic premise is that our task, as Christians who are ambassadors, our task is to enable our audience of today to understand the Scriptures of eternity. That's our main task, is we have to somehow build bridges in such a way that people here and now can understand the scripture. Now we do that in several different ways. Uh, for one, it's the part of it is the language that we use. Now the real obvious thing in this passage is that he used Aramaic and not Greek. Um, obviously, most of the people that most of us are speaking to were speaking in English, so they can understand it. That's obvious. Although, if you go somewhere else or, or go to uh, you know, speak to people um, who have a different language, obviously, you need to adjust. 
but but more importantly than that is using uh, or or not using language that will become an obstacle. We have a lot of Christianese. We use a lot of words that are kind of foreign through the daily life of of most Americans. Do we use words um, that are simply obstacles? That are simply strange. You know, when Paul uh, spoke here, again, he spoke in Aramaic. It kind of reminds me a little bit of, you know, when I I go back to Boston or Vermont, you know, where I grew up. If I don't want to look like a tourist, and I never really liked looking like a tourist, I like to pretend that I know what I'm doing, even when I really don't. But it's always, I find myself kind of almost automatically slipping into the local language, maybe getting a little bit of an accent back, but also just sort of dropping hints that, oh no, I, I'm from here, I grew up here. Yeah, I'm visiting an old buddy, I used to live you know, down the way a bit. So that the people will sort of see me as one of them, right, and, and hopefully treat me nicer. A couple months ago, uh, back in February, which seems like just years ago now, since it was before, you know, coronavirus was really on most of our radars, um, I, went, uh, I went backpacking in New Hampshire back in February, and I drove up there one day, and I got there uh, a little before sunset, and I was planning to hike um, kind of uh, after dark uh, up, a, up a big mountain uh, and, and be out for several days. As I pull into the parking lot and I'm getting ready, there's, um, there's a man and woman in this um, truck. They had been snowmobiling all day. They just got back and there we start chatting. And uh, I'm like, well, it's, you know, are you going to be okay out there? It's pretty cold. It's zero. It's uh, lots of snow, blah, blah, blah. And, and uh, they ended by saying, we just want to make sure you're going to be okay, Mr. Pennsylvania, as they're looking at my license plate. Now, of course, I had to kind of defend my honor a little bit, so I had to explain to them that I, no, 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 I actually grew up around here. And I've been here bunches of times, I've done this a lot, don't worry, I'll be okay. And with that assurance that I was sort of a local, I knew what I was doing, they seemed okay, and everything worked out just fine. So Paul sort of does the same thing, he says, no, 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 look, I'm a local, I'm from here. And when we interact with people, especially as we intend to uh, proclaim scripture to them, to tell them about Jesus. It's helpful for us as we're building bridges just to use the right language. To figure out who we're speaking to and use the right, right language so that it breaks down barriers. They understand, okay, either I'm, I'm one of you or I, I know how to speak to you. And I can convince you that I have some credibility just by the words I use maybe by the accent that I put on. Sometimes we, sometimes the process of removing unintended and unnecessary obstacles is by simply untangling what it means to follow Jesus from our Christian subculture. We don't always recognize how deep our subculture runs But there are a lot of things out there that are, some of them are misconceptions, but they're still ideas that people have about what it means to be a Christian. And a lot of that has to do with our Christian subculture. Does it mean I have to vote a certain way? I have to speak a certain way? I have to listen to certain kinds of music? Watch certain kinds of uh, movies? Do I have to have a certain orientation? Do I have to educate my kids a certain way? And we must be really careful as we build bridges to say, look, following Jesus may not have anything to do with any of those conceptions that you have about the Christian subculture. And what we need to remember is that you and I and everybody else in this world does not need to be saved from our politics, our potty mouths, our behavior. We need to be saved from unbelief. So we need to call people to believe, not to modify their behavior, not to sign on to all these extras that exist in the Christian subculture, which may or may not have anything to do with following Jesus faithfully. We need to center our message on repentance and belief. 
that the good news is good news if you believe. Not if you just modify your behavior to do all the things that we do in the Christian subculture. Not if you use the right words and right language and memorize the confessions. No. It's if you repent and believe. So let's make sure we untangle those things. Let's not create obstacles. Let's not mix together things that should never be mixed together. Also, another principle here is that we need to translate the language or the stories of Scripture into modern analogies. Now, that may sound complicated, but in some ways it's really not. And we do that sort of automatically anyway. Every time you see a children's sermon, that's what we're doing. We're taking some truth of Scripture and we're presenting it in such a way that they understand it. Hopefully that's what we're doing. Some days work better than others with that. It's what you do at youth group. It's a little bit different with youth. Obviously they can understand more. It doesn't take quite as much translation. But we still need to somehow get the, get the stories into, into their words, into their language, and not present any unnecessary obstacles. We even do this in Sunday school classes with adults. We do it in sermons. We try to give illustrations so that you can understand the truths of Scripture. So it speaks to you so you can, so you can understand what the Scripture is saying to you. So as we talk to our friends and our neighbors and our family and our coworkers about Jesus, we need to translate, translate kind of in quotes there, into modern analogies so they can understand it. Some of that is the words we use. Some of that is untangling it from things that are unnecessary. But the biggest principle when it comes to building bridges is simply make sure you know where the bridge is going. You need to understand where both ends of the bridge are. At one end of the bridge is today's culture or the specific culture and the specific person that you are speaking to. That's one end of the bridge. The other end of the bridge has to be Jesus and the gospel. Don't build bridges somewhere else. It's not going to work. The other end of the bridge is not behavior modification. The other end of the bridge is not just therapeutic feel-goodism. No, the other end of the bridge is Christ. And Paul, when he speaks, he focuses on different aspects of Christ, but it always comes back to Christ. It's what did Christ do for Paul? In verses 8 and 10, it's about the conversion and his whole uh, conversion experience. In verse 18, it's his commissioning. Jesus says, make haste, get out of Jerusalem. They won't accept your testimony about me. He sends them out. That's really about his sending. And in 21, it's about his commissioning. For he will, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And Jesus gives them his marching orders. This is what you're going to be about, Paul. You're going to go to the Gentiles. That's going to be you. That's one aspect of Christ. Another aspect of Christ is in verse 14. He said, that's Ananias, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and that's in caps, capital R, capital O, the righteous one, to hear a voice from his mouth. And what's happening there is it's actually it's bridge building between the prophets and Jesus, because the righteous one is, is a sort of a, almost a technical term or a prophetic term for the Messiah. We see it in, uh, in Isaiah chapter 32, it's going to be a messianic king who is the righteous one. In Isaiah 53, verse 11, the whole chapter about the suffering servant, described as a righteous one. God's servant will be a righteous one. In Jeremiah 23, 5, the Davidic king will be a righteous one. In Zechariah 9, 9, Zion's king, Jerusalem's king, will be a righteous one. And so there's this tie in scripture between a king, a Davidic king, Zion's king, Jerusalem's king, a messianic king who is a righteous one. And Paul makes sure that the Jews understand that he's referring to the righteous one 
It's referring to Jesus. So he's connecting for them the words of the prophets to Jesus. When we build bridges, we have to connect whoever we're speaking to to Jesus. Most of the time, it won't be going through a list of Old Testament prophets. But wherever our starting point is, the ending point has to be Jesus. In verse 17, when he talks about going back into the temple and falling into a trance and then seeing Jesus and all that, it's actually an echo of Isaiah 6, and Isaiah's call. Let me just read from Isaiah 6 for a minute. He says, in the, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, and each had six wings, and two, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And skipping down to verse 5. Woe is me, I am lost, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. This Lord of hosts who is a king. It's the Lord filling the temple. Now Paul, he's in the temple. And he sees the Lord of hosts. He sees Jesus. So now he's connecting this, the Lord of hosts from the Old Testament that aspect of who God is. And he's connecting that to Jesus as well. So Paul is building bridges, but the bridge always ends with Christ. That's always the destination. That's why whenever Paul speaks, it always centers on Christ. It's Christ-centric. So as we go out and we speak to our neighbors and friends in formal sort of Right now I know I'm witnessing, not right now I know I'm evangelizing, or just in our relationships in general. As we're speaking to them, being polite, using words that they understand when we talk about church things. Whatever we're doing, we're always hoping to tie it back eventually to Christ. Because the ultimate goal isn't that they behave better or vote differently or like us. But the hope is that they've come to believe that Christ is the Savior. Christ is God, and in him they have forgiveness of sin if they repent and believe. That's the hope that all of us have. When we boil down our faith, that's what it comes down to. We tend to go off the rails when we start adding on to it. In this passage, we find that Paul kind of lives within two worlds, between two worlds. Again, getting back to the title of John Stott's book, Between Two Worlds. You know, last week we looked and Paul was sort of stuck between two different groups of Jews. One who were legalists and others who were racist. And he was stuck in the middle. And again, he's stuck in the middle, this time between the Jews and the Romans. <clears throat> and so believers, like Paul, like us, we always live between two worlds. And we can mean that in different ways. One, there's the sense of we live between uh, this life and the next. We've been crucified with Christ and we've died in Christ. We've already been born again. And yet we're still waiting for our new life to be kind of full, fully consummated. We live in the already and the not yet. We've already been saved, and yet we're still awaiting our full salvation. We live in one world, but we're living for the next world. In Philippians, Paul puts it this way, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. And you sense in Paul that he's stuck between these two worlds. On the one hand, he kind of wishes he was just with Christ in heaven and glory. On the other hand, he's happy to sort of complete his mission here on earth. And I think Christians should always feel that tension. That tension of desiring, longing to be with the Lord. And yet also desiring and longing to, to be right here 
and do what he has for us right now. That's one tension. When we say between two worlds, that's, that's one way of looking at it. But there's another way of looking at between two worlds, two different worlds. And that is the worlds of the worldly unbelievers on the one hand and the religious traditionalists on the other hand. And I'll explain what I mean by religious traditionalists in just a moment. But Paul's sort of stuck between these two. You have the worldly unbelievers, the Romans, and the religious traditionalists, the Jews. Paul is too Jewish for the Romans, and he's too Roman for the Jews. The Romans don't like him because he's a Jew. The Jews don't like him because it kind of sounds like he's okay with Rome, or at least the Gentiles. We should feel that same tension between worldly unbelievers, those outside the church, and also some of those who are inside the church. The worldly unbelievers, that's sort of the easy part in a way. We should hopefully recognize that we're, that we're different, and hopefully they recognize it as well. In 1 Peter, he puts it this way, 1 Peter 4, verses 3 to 5. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. In other words, everything you've done in the past, all that stuff that you were doing, that's, that's sufficient. You don't need to do it anymore. What the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. So your old drinking buddies before you were a believer, and they look at you and go, why don't you drink anymore? Instead of Saturday nights going out with the guys, you, you want to get ready for church the next day? And they malign you. The guys at work who just think you're kind of a dork because of what you believe or what you do, they malign you. And Peter's saying, look, the time for doing all that stuff is in the past. You've got something different now that you're looking for. Verse 2, he says, so live for the rest of time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. So your focus is different than them. And frankly, they think you're a weirdo. And frankly, you probably are. We should be weirdos. Weirdos for Jesus. Turn that into a bracelet or something. Weirdos for Jesus. We should be kind of odd. We shouldn't fit in. You know, if you ever travel overseas, especially outside of kind of the Western world, you know that Americans kind of stick out. That's what it should be like living in this world. We're not citizens of this world, we're citizens of heaven. We're strangers in a strange land and we should stick out. We should be kind of odd. We should be weirdos. There's probably something wrong if we're not. So be a weirdo. Don't go out of your way to be a weirdo. But just by the fact that you're living for the will of God, that's going to come in conflict with the values of this world. And so you're going to be odd. Be odd. Not for the sake of being odd, but for the sake of Jesus. So Christians should always have that tension on the one hand, the one world that they're between, of the worldly unbelievers. Who just kind of tease you or mock you or malign you for what you believe and what you do. We don't need to get into specifics. We know. We know what those are. And you know what they are for you personally, the ones that really kind of dig at you. It's okay. It's probably a good thing. So the other world, on the other hand, we have the religious traditionalists. Now, I'm not picking on people who are religious, and I'm not picking on tradition. There's a difference between tradition and traditionalism. And I'm just going to go uh, with what Yaroslav Pelikan, uh, how he put it. Yaroslav Pelikan uh, distinguishes them this way. He says, tradition, <coughs> tradition is the living faith of the dead. 
Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. It's a great quote. Tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. Traditions are good things. We build upon all the saints who have gone before us who are now dead. We build upon their living faith, their active faith. All the things that they thought and they did and the songs that they composed and the creeds that they wrote. And we, and we bring those into our tradition. And they help us. They're part of the living faith. But traditionalism is a dead faith that has become just ritual and rote and a rut. It's become meaningless and pointless. It's dead faith who are people that are living today but aren't living for Jesus. They're just sticking to their traditions, their traditionalism. And they've come to love their way of doing things more than they love Jesus. Their rituals that once pointed, once pointed to a living faith have now become warped and they only point to themselves. That's the tension on the other hand is we know people who claim the name of Christ, call themselves Christians, but their faith is nothing but traditionalism and it's a dead faith and they get upset when you try to actually follow Jesus and actually do what he says. And there's a lot of ways that our traditionalism comes out sideways. And you can ask the disciples and read the Gospels. Jesus was always getting his followers into awkward situations. His disciples signed on, said, yeah, we'll follow Jesus. And the next thing they know, they're at a tax collector's house having dinner. And everyone's looking at him funny. If you follow Jesus, you're going to find yourself in some awkward situations where the religious traditionalists are saying, what are you doing? They'll call you out. Don't be, don't be nice to those people. What are, you, what are you, a sinner too? But their devotion to following Jesus got them in some awkward spots. Think about Jesus' followers, tax collectors, political zealots, fishermen, white collar, blue collar, Jesus forced them all to focus on God's mission and God's will and the cross, not their personal pet peeves. Matthew's old tax collector buddies probably thought he got religion and got a little too zealous. We're fine if you have a little religion, but that's a little taken a little too far, Matthew. Simon Zealot's friends probably thought he sold out. See, the followers of Jesus will often have a hard time fitting in. As the old book, if the world fits, then you're the wrong size. If you're following Jesus, you'll get pushed back on both sides. You'll get pushed back from within the church and from outside the church. You're going to have to work hard to build bridges in both directions. So that all can hear the words of Jesus, no matter what presuppositions that they have. We need to keep in mind the tensions of living between two worlds. We have to make sure we don't get caught up in either one of them. But live faithfully for Christ. To live with a single-mindedness. Seeing Jesus as the central focus of our life. Our past testimony, our present life and our future glory. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, our God, we're so thankful that Christ is our all in all. We're thankful that we have no need of anything else. Lord, help us to be mindful of the two worlds that we live between, this life and the next, the different parties that we find ourselves between in this life, the world, those who are within the church. Let us focus on Christ alone, live for him faithfully. Let those who talk poorly be ignored. Lord, let us chase hard after you. Lord, we pray for any who are watching, who, are, who have not called upon you, who are not Christians. 
May this be the day they recognize that Christ is the center of everything. They would call upon you for a changed life, for a changed heart, for forgiveness of sin. Pray that they would repent and believe. We pray, Lord, for the rest of us who have called upon you, who are believers. Lord, we pray that you would help our unbelief. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This time we'll be singing our closing hymn together. receive the benediction of the Lord. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. We do hope that you will join us immediately following this service if you're watching on Sunday morning uh, for our live fellowship hour on Zoom, which will begin about 1045 or maybe a little sooner. And that will lead right into our Sunday school time, our adult Sunday school time at 1115. Uh, last week we had over 50 adults that were able to join us and it was good just to see all the faces uh, as well as to be able to have some conversation as much as, as much as you can with that many people on Zoom. But it was a, a wonderful time. I hope you join us. Uh, also, please join us on Zoom on Tuesday, uh, about 12.15, during the lunch hour. Uh, we'll meet from 12.15 to 12.45, uh, just to, to talk, to catch up, uh, and then to pray as well. So you should have had those uh, links go out um, in an email on Friday to the whole church. Uh, please also look through the bulletin that went along with that email for some other announcements and updates. Hope you have a wonderful Lord's Day.